Just waiting on the approval. <laughs> What's this? This is new. Wow. What's that mean? It's like I can write something now. Ooh. Hey, thanks very much, Admin. Okay, good evening and welcome back to the Socially Distanced Fest. My name's Callum Lycan and I am a Scottish storyteller. Uh, hopefully you've uh, followed me, you've listened to a few of the tales that I've had to tell, and I thought I'd come on again uh, tonight to tell another one. Thanks very much again, guys. You know, um, before I get into a story, though, again, I, I like to do this in front of every video because I think it's really important. We're all going through this really challenging time at the moment. Everything's a struggle. Uh, but for performers, oh, my goodness, I, I'm just seeing such oh, nightmare things. Myself, I'm not working until August now. I know I've got friends that are now exceeding beyond August. A lot of our live gigs have just been cancelled. So thank you to the Social Distance Fest for doing this because this gives as an opportunity to continue to perform and entertain and give something back. But do bear in mind, folks, if you're enjoying these videos, there is little tip jar links on every video uh, to our own personal tip jars. So you can actually help us continue doing what we love and what we're passionate about. Help us continue through this very interesting period in, in human existence by giving us a little donation for every performance we do even if it's a couple of dollars you know think about it the more couple of dollars we get that that goes towards paying bills and paying rents etc and as i say it's like buying us a cup of coffee it's the best way to put it however i'm also doing this i'm being really cheeky tonight because i forgot i had these i have these fabulous download cards make sure i've got that the right way so you're not getting a free download voucher um, but basically these are to my uh cd scottish bedtime stories uh i'm not gonna lie to you they're not for kids they're gruesome grisly dark vile delightful tales of scottish scottish history and if anybody does donate uh to my tip jar over the value of 15 dollars for any of my events what i will do is make sure uh you've got an email address there and i will email you and we'll get in touch and i will give you uh the download code for a copy of my scottish bedtime stories uh cd or downloadable cd so anyone who does uh d donate a tip of over 15 dollars uh, make sure that uh, you have an email attached to that so I can get in touch with you and we'll get that off to you. And that gives you a good 72 minutes, roughly, of gruesome and grisly Scottish tales, not for the faint of heart. But now that I've done all that, you know what? Let's get into a story. It is actually the 700th anniversary of the signing of our broth. So this is actually an incredibly key piece of Scottish history. This is effectively Scotland winning its independence, um, well, you know, a long time ago, to be honest, back in the 1300s. But the 1300s is a, a very, very important period in Scottish history because I speak to a lot of people who have Scottish heritage from all over the world. They've got ancestry and a lot of people are interested in the folk heroes and heroes and history of Scotland. And two characters seem to have captured everyone's hearts. The first being William Wallace. Ah, Wallace, the boy scout of Scotland, an honest soul who fought for his country and sadly died. And then the second fella, Robert the Bruce, the man who would be king and became king of scotland now i will be honest and say i'm a big fan of the bruce not so much of wallace the reason is being scottish we are taught to fight dirty we're taught you know a harsh world we're a, a sturdy stout rather brash race of people and wallace was just too nice i mean okay he was butchering and massacring and killing english people no offense to any english that are listening please uh you know, I've got a lot of good English friends, so this isn't an anti-English thing. But the problem was he, he seemed to be a really nice, honest guy. And, and you can't trust that in Scotland. The Bruce, on the other hand, he was a bit of a treacherous so-and-so. He fought for Scotland as many times as he fought against it. But this is a story about Robert the Bruce. And basically, 
the most famous battle he took part in, which won Scotland's independence, the Battle of Bannockburn, which led to the signing of our broth, which is happening this year, the 700th anniversary. But to give you a bit of background about Robert the Bruce, he was a man who, as I say, fought for the English as well as he fought for the Scots. His family, basically like a lot of the lords and nobles, they basically had ties in both countries, so they had to protect their own. But the Bruces were confident and pretty much vying for the throne of Scotland through different generations, his grandfather, his father, and then Robert the Bruce himself. And they had one major competition, and that was the Comwins, uh, a huge clan from up north in Scotland. And both those families were fighting for the throne. Now, it just so happened one day, after a lot of problems and a lot of bloodshed and fighting, that Robert the Bruce and John Coleman decided to meet in a little kirkyard called Greyfriars Kirkyard in Dumfries. If anyone's been to the city of Edinburgh, uh, you know there's a Greyfriars Kirkyard there, but this was actually the one in Dumfries. And they sat down and had a conversation. And the result of that chat was this. The Coleman said, you take the throne. We are stepping back you can be the king of the scots now robert the bruce was delighted so excited with this but the next thing he knows he's being summoned to england now he doesn't realize that anything's afoot he thinks everything's fine so he travels down to england thinking he's going to go and see uh, the king edward longshanks the the hammer of the scots a delightful fella um he thinks he's just going for another kind of meeting, as they often did, the Lords always had to do. So as he's about to walk into the, the court of Longshanks, somebody steps from the shadows and hands him a package. And that package has two gold coins and a set of spurs. It's a signal to Robert. It says he's been betrayed. He needs to flee, buy a horse and get out of here. And that's what he does. He gets on his horse and he rides back to Scotland. He now knows he has been betrayed, but the problem is Longshanks knows that he was wanting to be the King of Scots. So now Longshanks is after him as well. But first, Bruce has a settle to score, a score to settle. I'm getting my words back to front tonight. He has a score to settle. So he calls Conwyn again and they have another meeting at Greyfriars Kirkyard and everything's going fine. Apparently there's wine and there's food and they're just chatting and everything is pleasant until Bruce steps up and goes, why did you betray me? And at that, the Conwyn knows he's been found out. Swords are drawn and they have a duel in the courtyard, resulting in the Conwyn being slain. Now, Robert the Bruce knows he's made a terrible mistake. For starters, he's just killed a man in consecrated ground, but also he knows that Longshanks will be coming for him. So him and his men ride as hard as they can to Schoon up in Scotland, where the Bruce sits on the throne and is crowned King of the Scots before anyone else can argue, before the church can excommunicate him even more importantly. So now there is the Bruce, the King of the Scots. And at this point, folks, I know you're sitting there and you're probably thinking, oh, he's now the King, how lovely. You know, dances, food, parties. Not for the Bruce. For the next so many years, it was said that the Bruce hid in the heathers. His whole existence was basically escaping capture and slaughter. He was traveling through the highlands, building up men, but fighting off other Scots that were trying to get the bounty on his head. He travel, traveled to the Hebridean Isles and basically sought shelter there, all the time building an army, all the time recruiting men, until he had enough to begin. And he began slowly but surely fighting back bit by bit by bit, castle by castle by castle. Now, if any of you have had the joy of going to Scotland, you'll have seen our beautiful castles. But more often than not, as an old tour guide in Scotland, I was asked this question. Why 
are the castles all in ruins? Now, we don't call them ruins. We call them organised stones. And the reason for this is because it was Robert the Bruce who did this. When he took back a castle from the English to stop them coming back and taking it again, he had his men dismantle the castles. Take the castles down and it stops the English having a foothold again. So bit by bit, the Bruce is taking back his Scotland until two castles are left. Edinburgh Castle and Stirling Castle, the gateway to the north. Now, I will say one thing for the Bruce. How many men were the most inventful people when taking back castles? Uh, there's accounts of them dressing as cows to cross a field in the moonlight. Like, I want you to imagine an army of men with cow skins on their back bent over, going moo as they slowly advance on the walls. There's stories of him night after night wading into moats up to his nose to try and find a path over for his men to get over to the wall. I love Edinburgh Castle because it was taken because of love. They discovered that one of the old guards of the castle had found a way down the great kind of uh, volcanic walls that surround the castle. They sheer off every so often and it had actually created a natural but very, very hidden stairwell. And he had basically been going out night after night because his girlfriend was in the grass market. So he was going out and having his little moments and then sneaking back into the castle before anyone knew it. And when the Bruce's men found this, they sought him out and got him to show them the way up into the castle. I love it. But Stirling was the key. Stirling was the castle that everyone wanted because if you took Stirling, you had control of the highlands of Scotland. So the Bruce sent his own brother, Edward the Bruce, to take Stirling. And Edward lay siege to that castle for months and months and months, and he was getting nowhere. So he thought he would be very, very clever, and he would um, parley with the representative of the English army in the castle, the governor. And um, they came up with a deal, a very simple deal, and it sounds very practical. So Bear with, me, bear with me while I explain it to you, very simply. If you can get an English army up to Stirling within a year to relieve the garrison, the Scots will simply retreat and leave their claim to Stirling. However, if no English army does arrive within a year, you must vacate the castle and we will take it over. And it sounds Perfect. What a nice, amicable arrangement. But Robert was furious. He was so angry at his brother. He couldn't believe how foolish his brother had been, you see. If you've seen that dreadful movie Braveheart, you'll understand what I'm about to say to you. The Scots lacked certain resources. The English had a very effective weapon against us. Their cavalry, the mounted knights charging at the Scots was enough to scatter an army. We knew in an open field we'd be destroyed by them and that is what the Bruce had been avoiding. He had been doing what every Scot all the way back to the Picts had been doing. Guerrilla warfare, skirmish, retreat, skirmish, retreat. He's furious at his brother. He has just handed Longshanks what he wanted. And I'll let you know how angry he was at his brother, folks. He sent him to Ireland. Now, no, I know you're thinking that sounds derogatory. No, no. He sent him to fight the Irish to try and take the crown of Ireland, hoping effectively his brother would be wiped out by this. That's how angry the Bruce was. But now he knew he had a battle to fight and it had laid the stage for Bannockburn, the greatest battle to be. Well, the Bruce got his men together. They started laying traps, but luck was also on the Bruce's side. Edward Longshanks, the hammer of the Scots, had died, leaving his son. 
who was not even a quarter of the man his father was. He was a useless individual, putting his, his own favourites and positions in the court. He was creating a, a situation of civil war and disruption in the English army by granting his favourite men a position here and a position there, even if they knew nothing. But now he gathered these armies and he marched them up to Scotland at quick pace. Many deserted, but they kept coming and coming. And the stage was set. But Bannockburn is a very unusual battle because a lot of people think it was won on the actual day of the battle. But the stories will tell you it was won the day before. And it wasn't won by a mighty skirmish. It was won by one man. You see, on the day, the day before Bannockburn, Robert the Bruce knew that he was he was having to get his men ready. You know, he'd prepared escape routes, but he, you know he had to make sure his men were ready. So he was riding up and down in front of his men, inspire, inspiring them. He was on a little palfrey. We didn't have war horses. We had ponies, or as we called them. Palfreys. He was wearing just a simple leather jerkin and he had a single-handed axe at his side. And he rode up and down, up and down, inspiring his men, you know. Uh, you know, the usual thing you'd say, we're gonna, we're gonna crush the English. And of course the Scots would go wild. We're gonna um uh, we're gonna steal all their food so they're starving when they come into battle and the Scots would go crazy. Oh yes, amazing. We're gonna steal their underwear so they're as cold as us. And the Scots would have lost it. But as the Bruce was riding back and forth in front of his men, inspiring them, he'd actually started to drift away. He hadn't even noticed that he'd got further and further away from his men. And right at that moment, it happened. Coming through the Tor woods was a group of English knights. You see, they were so sick of the young Edward that they had decided they would fulfill the deal and get relief to the garrison. It didn't matter if it was one or two of them. It basically meant if the English could get to the castle, there would be no Bannockburn and they could all go home. So they decided to ride. But as they came into view of the Scottish army, one of those knights couldn't help but noticing this lone rider. And it took him no time at all to realise who it was. Robert the Bruce, King of the Scots. And this knight saw opportunity. He dropped his visor, kicked the flanks of his mighty horse and tilted his lance and started to charge. Henry de Bowen saw an opportunity to win glory and victory and he started to charge at the king. Now the Scottish army would have seen this and they would have started panicking and roaring and bellowing at their king and running towards them. But they knew he was too far away, but they would have tried. They'd have been going hell for leather. Robert the Bruce would have seen this night coming and you would have thought he would have, uh, well, you thought he'd have ridden back to his men, but he didn't. On this day, Robert the Bruce simply turned his horse to face the knight that was charging at him. The Bowen would have been dreaming of wealth and glory and coin and riches. He'd have been thinking he's about to become the most famous man on the planet. The Scottish army would have been screaming and roaring, running at their king, desperate to save him, hoping that they could reach him, but knowing in their hearts it was hopeless. And all the Bruce did was sit and face this knight charging at him. Now it's said that these great war horses uh, could get up to about sort of 50, 60 kilometers an hour at full pace. So this thing is thundering across the field. The Scots are screaming and running and charging and the Bruce is sitting, waiting. Has he given up? Has he decided this is the only way to save all these men? He just sits and waits, and de Bowen is staring, getting closer and closer, tilting his lance, targeting the king, knowing that this is it. 
This is his moment. And as De Bowen gets closer and closer, as the Scots scream and roar and beg their king to come to them, the Bruce just sits there and waits to die. De Bowen is getting closer and closer and closer. He's now targeting the king's heart, knowing that if this hits, it will tear the king asunder. And as that lance gets closer and closer, the Bruce just sits and waits. But it's said that as that lance came within a hair's breadth of the king, he kicked the flanks of his pony and it stepped to the side and the lance simply continued without hitting him. And as the Bowen rode by, the Bruce raised himself high in his stirrups, pulling out his single-handed axe and bringing it down upon the helm of the Bowen, cleaving both helm and skull in twain. The lifeless body of the Bowen would have hit the ground before he even knew he was dead. The Scots would have stopped for a minute, disbelieving before the heavens would have been filled with the roars and bellows. And Robert the Bruce simply turned his horse and slowly cantered back to his men. Now that night, the Bruce would have gotten your full off his men because basically, uh, he uh, he had an open court system. He, anyone could speak to him as, as an equal. So his men would have berated him for the carelessness of his and rash actions. If he had died, all would be lost. But Robert the Bruce took it, listened to it, acknowledged it, and accepted his mistake. And as he was walking back to his own tent, all of a sudden he stops. And he looks down at his hand as if for the first time he realises that he's still clenching the broken axe handle tight in his grip. And it's said that the only thing he commented, or the only statement he made of that day is when he saw that axe handle and a sad look fell on his face. And he simply said, Oh, I've broken my best axe. Robert the Bruce, King of the Scots, forget your Clint Eastwoods, forget your, your uh, Sylvester Stallone's quick, witty remarks. That to me is the finest comment that any heroic figure could ever make after such a great victory. And it was a victory, you see, because the English army were disturbed by this. How can a lightly armoured man kill a knight, what is effectively a tank in modern times, and ripples of fear went through the English army. Was it witchcraft? Were the Scots using a special weapon? But in the night, many an Englishman deserted. And when it came to the Battle of Bannockburn, there was such disarray, such confusion that the Scots simply marched and marched. The children kept going and going and pushing the horsemen back. The horsemen crushed the archers. The archers crushed the infantry. And it's said that they all tumbled and crashed into the burn that is of Bannockburn. And by the end of the battle, you could walk dry shod over the bodies that had created a bridge. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Battle of Bannockburn, the greatest victory in all of Scotland. And you wonder why I'm so passionate, why I'm so happy with this story. It's because it's the only victory we really had. So we're going to cling to that, folks. We're going to make sure that that story stays in our hearts till the end of days. Because you know what? If it's the only victory we ever had, we're going to make sure it was like yesterday. Thank you very much for listening. And do remember, if you are enjoying the stories, if you're enjoying any of the performances out there, do pop a little something in the tip jars for the performers. This is what a lot of us do for a living. And at the moment, unfortunately, this is all we can do uh, for a living. I am in my little padded studio cell um, telling stories, which is very unusual because normally I can see your faces. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the story. If you do have a theme, an idea of a story you'd like to hear, pop a comment down for me and I will try and fulfill that over the coming weeks to tell you some stories that you are requesting. But it has been a pleasure as always. Remember, if anyone does tip over $15, 
Make sure your email's there and you will get a copy. I will email you a download key for Scottish Bedtime Stories. Thank you very much, folks. Have a lovely and wonderful evening.